Well, good morning. Man, the song, the singing this morning was awesome. I just didn't sense, I could sense that enthusiasm. And I can't help but think about the root word of that, in theos, which is in God. So truly, Christians have everything to be enthusiastic about. Um, hey, children, were, is anybody bummed this morning when you woke up and there was no snow? <laughs> I'm a, I must still be a kid. I probably woke up three or four times in the night looking out the window for snow, and it just never came. Um, but I noticed there was still a lot of fun going on and getting wet and muddy, but if it had been just about five degrees colder, we would have had a lot of snow. A um, lot of good memories here, and I, I think of even just the privilege of bringing our young people and our children here to places like this in this environment to, to connect and build relationships and all that. I guess I have a question to start off. Why are you here this morning? And there may be a whole variety of reasons. You know, a lot of people made a lot of effort to go a long way up through the fog and the, the rain, but why are you here? I thought for myself, one of the reasons that I'm here, and it's so good to see so many I haven't seen, some visitors, welcome. Uh, you've already been an encouragement to me, but um, one of the reasons I, I want to be here, I made the effort to be here, is I need that, the, um, the strength we get from one another as iron sharpens iron, and I want to be encouraged to live a godlier life. And uh, that's what I want to do this morning is to encourage you, uh, maybe to light a fire under you, especially you young people, if that's what you need, or especially you young men. You know, I, as Peter says, I think it's 2 Peter 3 8, to grow. I want to challenge you, maybe get you out of your comfort zone, to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because those of us that are saved, think about the message, the life changing message we have. That is an awesome message to be able to share. I think of this term, some things spread like wild, wildfire. Um, I watched uh, some of my wife and some of my kids the other day watch the Samson movie. And you know there's a, if you go to Judges chapter 15, I believe, it talks about some of the exploits of, of Samson. And there's this one scene, when you think about it, it's pretty morbid, but you know he, he captures oh, 300 foxes, I believe. And um, he, he basically ties them, lights their tails on fire, and sends them out to the Philistine um, wheat fields. It was the time of harvest. And the bottom line is the, the wheat was destroyed, the olive groves were destroyed, the vineyards were destroyed. But the, the, just the picture that I have in the movie, they do a good job. You just see these, in the dark, in the night, these lights going out through the fields, and pretty soon there's just flames and a bonfire. So I, I want to make this application about... Um, we're told in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A city that's up on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all that are in the house. In the verse 16, we all know well very much, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, but glorify your Father, which is in heaven. But just that thought of letting our light shine. So I want to consider this morning maybe this question. What does it mean to be a godly man or a godly woman in just a crazy culture that we live in today? What does that look like to be a godly man or a godly woman? You know, I got a phone call the day before I came up here by a man who's in his 90s. A man I respect a lot, appreciate his life. And he said, James, I would love to be up there, but I can't. And he shared a few words with me of encouragement. And he's famous for his one-liners. He said, when I hang up, I know you're busy at work right now. I'm, gonna, I'm not good at this, but I'm going to send you a text. And uh, it's a couple of my one-liners. So about 20 minutes later, I get this one-liner. And, and we talked. This is Dave Bowen. A lot of you know him in his 90s. And he's like... You know, I struggle with change. I don't really like change. And maybe some in this room can relate to that. But he said, we must adjust to changing times, but still hold on to unchangeable principles. We must adjust to changing times, but still hold on to unchanging principles. And he sent me a bonus one. He said, here's another one. It's better to die with a conviction than to live a life of compromise. 
better to die with the conviction than to live a life of compromise. And I, I guess the older that I get, I just love older people that are still an encouragement, a breath of fresh air, and that are happy with life. And I know that, that as you get older, as we get older, the aches and pains increases, some of the trials of life kind of weigh on you. But, um, you know, I was at a job site the other day, and I and it, had this really neat older man, distinguished, he seemed so friendly. And then a little bit later, he was just cursing, and every other word was the F word, and it's just like, oh man, here's a guy in his 70s, and that's what's coming out. So I guess my encouragement to me and all you older ones that are, that are getting older, be a joyful older person. It is so refreshing and, and so exciting in spite of the, the circumstances. You know, I sent my family, we, we'll text during the week, we have a group text, just fun things back and forth, or a word of encouragement, and there was this this older lady that was probably in her 90s in a wheelchair, and she was exercising, and she had this lady take her out into the, the room, and the, the music started, and she couldn't even get out of a wheelchair. But, you know, she's, like, just moving, but her laugh was so infectious, and, and she just kept giggling and, and laughing, you know. But I thought, man, the joy of the Lord is what? It's your strength. And we, whether you're old or young, we have so much to be thankful for. I have this book at home, it's called um, Halftime, and it's a book by uh, Bob Buford, and very thought-provoking, and the subtitle is it, Moving from Success to Significance, and uh, let me just share you kind of a little bit of the, the thrust behind the book. How many in this room are, let's say, between 16 and 40 right now? Raise your hand. There's a lot. Okay, how about 40 and above? So here's what's interesting about this book. He says, you know, when you're, when you're younger, especially a young man, and you have all these dreams, and it's good to have dreams. It's good to have goals, to start a career, to want to get married, to, to build a, a business, whatever. Those are really good things, but those are really things that maybe motivate you, and you really, really want it to be successful. And, and we'll talk about what success means. But then you get um, to a point in your life and I've been here for a little while. And um, you kind of have this growing awareness. Uh, the, ch the achievements that maybe once drove you to succeed, uh, they just don't seem as rewarding as they used to be. Um, there has to be more to life. And, and I think when you're in your 40s push and, and older, you start maybe reflecting and pausing and taking inventory on what really, really matters. Um, Marshall and I were talking yesterday and this morning, had some really good business, and he, he talked about, I don't know if it was his quote or someone else, and we were talking about retirement, which, which is a good thing to plan for retirement, we should, and there's a lot of biblical principles on planning, and before you build something, you have the, the wherewithal to do it, but just this thought of some of us, or in our culture, we're so focused on doing these amazing things, or building this huge platform, or having a bucket list, or you know, traveling the world, a lot of things that can be really, really legitimate, but I think it's so critical to say, what does God want me to be doing? And maybe it is some of these things, but our culture is so into me, look at me, look what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this, 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 and, and just this thought to stop and pause and take inventory, because that bridge we were talking about, Marshall, he said, some people build this bridge their whole life that they will never cross. Think about right now, you know, Clint Bowman's with the Lord. Thank God. Let's continue to pray for the family. But, you know, he probably had all kinds of dreams that he was going to do, and we all do. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. And a lot of you have went through heartache. You've lost loved ones. I've shared my story a lot of times when we're holding our daughter. She was dying. I wasn't thinking, man, I, want, I wish I had more money in the bank. I wish I was a famous athlete. I would, I would. It's all about perspective and relationships and your eternity at that moment. And so I want to encourage all of us, whatever age bracket you're in, to focus on things that really matter because a lot of times you may cross that bridge. You may climb that ladder and realize, you know what? You're just leaning against the wrong wall. There's so many stories of professional athletes, uh, of, of people that have made millions that are completely unfulfilled when they get there. And so I guess, um, 
a verse I quote a lot. It's kind of a, a motto, I guess, for my life. And it should be all of ours, and there's other verses. But in James 4, we're told this. What is your life? It's a mist that appears for a little while, and then it's gone. I don't care if you live till you're 10, or in your 90s like Billy Graham just did, and he's with the Lord. If you live to be 120, superimpose that on eternity. Your life is a mist. And then you, you go to Ephesians 5, and it says, be very careful then how you live making the most of every opportunity. I'm pretty paraphrasing. But just to think about, guys, what really, really, really matters in life. So if I could give any advice to someone younger than me or anybody, and if I could go back, I would say, spend more time pondering the path of your feet. Proverbs says, ponder the path of your feet, and let all your ways be established. Because young men, what we want to do is we're so fired up and we're ready to get this idea, this business, whatever, and they could be great things. And we want to jump in and just go. And sometimes you get down the line and you stop. So I'm going to encourage you, take the time before you jump in and ponder and meditate. Is God in this? To me, the wisest man that ever lived, you've heard me say this over and over. Some of you young ones haven't heard me say this. Solomon had more than I'll ever have. He had servants. He had money. He had ships that would go out and just acquire things and gold and silver and servants and pawns. And when all is said and done, in Psalms 127, 1, he says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. We have some building inspectors in this room, and we know one of the very most important inspections is that first foundation footing inspection. What kind of soil is it on? Are the footings deep enough? Do we have rebar? You could build a mansion on top of the sand and it's going to crumble. And so young people, that is your foundation. Unless the Lord build a house, they labor. Jesus Christ himself said, what will it profit a man if what? He gains the whole world but loses his soul. And the answer is that there is no profit. And Solomon said it's just like grasping of the wind. Get that mental picture. Grasping of the wind. So I want to challenge all of us today, especially you younger ones, make a commitment. Maybe this camp could be a change if you need it to commit and dedicate your life to the Lord. Uh, because we live in a culture today, way back, hundreds of years ago, Isaiah said this. Listen to this. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We live in a culture, we live in a society that there's no objective truth or morality. Everything is relative. You have your truth, I have my truth. Um, there's no accountability. Um, you think about the institution of marriage, Gender identity. We, we basically live in a society, if it feels good, what? Just do it. That's what we live. And, and the scripture just nails it. The shootings, the divorce, the immorality, the abortion, the rape, the just things that defy natural affection. You know, this, this moral decay that we are on, I believe, in America, they want to eliminate the Bible, they want to reverse morality. They demand tolerance, but then they're intolerant of those who are not tolerant. Uh, persecution. But I think if we're not careful as Christians to try to be adopt this tolerance, that we adopt the world's practices and then try to Christianize it. Because we want to be tolerant. So we're going to take these things, and there's so much that could be said about that, but it's been mentioned here today already. We serve such a powerful God. I mean, my mind can't even get around. Think about this. We live in time, space, and matter. There had to be something or someone to create a universe that has time, space, that, there had to be someone outside of that, right? That, that's what I call God. 
who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. That's how the Bible starts. The most powerful introduction. Ever. Can you imagine? We serve a God that spoke everything in existence. And then you hear people say, well, I can't believe it. The Bible has miracles. How could someone walk on water? How could, if God can speak the creation to existence, it's child's play that we could certainly walk on water. He made the water. And, um, you know, well, that defies science. It's not natural. Right, because it's supernatural. And God is outside of the natural. But that's a God that we serve. It's just this powerful God, but he wants a relationship with you. He wants a relationship with me. And James Verdugo gave some things last Sunday. I appreciate it. <clears throat> this thought of keep your heart with all diligence, Proverbs 4, or to guard your heart. Because, you know, you can get in all kinds of debates. You go online, and it's just sickening. You know, it's, you know, it's not guns, it's this, or people on the other side. It, here's, the, here's the bottom line, guys. It's nothing to do with guns or knives, or whatever. We live in a violent culture because it's a heart issue. And Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our hearts are deceitful, they're desperately wicked, who can know it? And, and so what we really need is a new heart, <laughs> a new heart transplant. We, we need to die to self, and then we're told if anyone's in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. So if, if you're here today, and it's, you're new, and, and you were invited, or maybe you're sitting here, and, and you're not saved. You know, the, the Lord could come back during this meeting. He could come back in a thousand years. I don't know. But knowing a lot of people, if, if the rapture happened right now, for one, I wouldn't be standing here. And I think the majority of this room would be gone. What about you? Have you asked Jesus Christ into your heart? 1 Corinthians 15. This is that good news I was talking about earlier, that we should share. Um, moreover, brethren, 1 Corinthians 15, first five verses. I declare to you the good news, the gospel, which I preach to you, which also you receive and which you stand, by which also you are saved, you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all, which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once. And at the time of this writing, most of them were still alive, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. It's the Bible refers to when you physically die. So if you're sitting here and you've never made an acknowledgement, just be honest with yourself. In Romans 3, it says that we've all sinned. Now having the, the privilege of having six children, one's with the Lord now, I didn't have to teach any of my children to be naughty, to sin. They just were born that way. I was too. It's natural. And every one of us, if you're honest, have said something you shouldn't, thought a lustful thought. We're sinners. And I think most here would easily say, yeah. yeah maybe I'm not as bad as this person. But we're all sinners. So... The very, very best that you can do, the Bible says it's filthy rags without the Lord. So before you can have good news, here's the bad news. If you recognize that you're a sinner here, which I do, Romans 6 has some disturbing news because it says the wages of sin, which is the payment of sin, is death. If you had a judge and somebody murdered your family member and he was in, in court, somebody has to pay that penalty. And that wouldn't be a good judge if he just let him go, right? So if you recognize you're a sinner and you're here today, you deserve death. Separation from God forever. But the greatest, I think, conjunction in the Bible goes on and says, 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Are you thankful for that good news? Nothing I could do. For by grace I've been saved through faith, not, not of myself, it's a gift of God. And the Bible knew me, because it goes around, not of works, lest any man should boast. Everybody thinks they have to do good or do better. Maybe you're here, it's like, oh, I'm going to clean up my life. Or, no, God will take you just like you are. And then he'll help you clean up your life. Your motivation's so different. I don't stand here and serve the Lord because I'm trying to gain his approval. I serve the Lord because I already have it. And when you know someone loves you so much... You could never earn it. Then you just want to serve them out of love. So I would plead with you today. Romans 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, what does it say? You will be saved. It's, it's the heart's attitude. You could do it right now. You could block me out and just say, Lord, I recognize what he's saying. I'm a sinner. Save me. Verse 13 says, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Today's the day of salvation. We're going to talk about some of Satan's tactics. He's going to want to desensitize you. Put it off. You know, I want to think about it. Today is the day of salvation. If you haven't asked him in your heart, I plead with you to do it. And then if the rapture comes... Hopefully this building will be empty. Now maybe you're saved here. And maybe this could be your prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. As David said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. One of Satan's tactics is he's going to beat you up for the past. Oh, I know what you did, Robbie. I know what you did, Blake. And he'll throw that up. But once you've asked for forgiveness and that's clean, you can move on. And you can plant, as I say, new seed. Because we're told, be not deceived, God does not mock. Whatever you sow, you're going to reap. But Satan wants to get you back and chain you to your past. But it was not a life sentence. It was just a lesson to learn. And so, if you're still alive today, God has some plans for you. Um, there was a time in history, all the way back in Genesis, think about this. The Lord saw the wickedness of man, that it was great on the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart of man was only evil, and that continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. And then another great conjunction. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the Hebrews, the, the faith chapter, Hebrews 11, it says, By faith Noah, he moved with godly fear, and he prepared an ark for the saving of his household. That's the man I want to be, don't you? To prepare an ark for my household. I want to move with godly fear. And so again, I challenge you, men and women, what are you living for? Who are you living for? You know, many men would die for somebody they love. I've never exactly been put in a situation. I've been put in some pretty intense situations. I don't even say this to brag. I think I would take a bullet for anyone in my family. And I think if, if, if someone was holding a gun to my head, I would. And some men, you know, they'll do these brave noble things. He's acts of hero. But here's the concern. So men, you may be willing to die for someone you love, but would you live for them? What about the daily life of just living for the Lord and being a servant? Uh, we heard some beautiful things um, a couple weeks ago at um, Chad's wedding. Just some beautiful beautiful truths and instructions that work. And if you apply them in your life, they work. But I, I just challenge you, I challenge me, be the man, be the woman of God that he called you to be. We're told in 1 Timothy 4, for bodily exercise profits a little. It does profit. I think, you know, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. We're the temple. I think it's a good testimony to try to take care of ourselves. 
to the best that we can and be a good testimony. But then it goes on, but godliness is profitable for all things, having a promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. So again, do you want to be a godly man and woman of God? And what I did is I've been doing some studies of many characters in the Bible that had a good reputation. And some of them are in the, the hero faith chapter. And I just kind of summarized them into 10 points. So young guys, listen up. And, and if someone wants some of my notes or a section of it, just shoot me a text or email and I'll, I'll send you everything you want to try to write it down. But I kind of categorized all these men and women and I put it into 10 characteristics of a godly man or a godly wife. So if you're here and you say, yeah, I want to be godly, how do these 10 points find you? Number one, I saw this characteristic of obedience. I'll go back through them in a minute. They had a commitment at a young age. They had a good testimony. They were hard workers. They were respectful. They were men and women of courage. They took criticism for their commitments. They were men and women of prayer. They stood for truth regardless of the consequences. And then number 10, they gave all praise and glory to the Lord. Just think about your understanding of the scripture. Think about people like David and Joseph and Isaac that were obedient to their physical father. And I think that translated to their heavenly father. You know, if you're not young, the second one is have a commitment at a young age. If you're older and you want to make a commitment, great. The Lord will take it. And from this point on, you can have a, a commitment. But we know Paul told Timothy, from a child, you've known the Holy Scriptures that are able to make you wise. And hold fast some of those traditions. All traditions aren't bad. There's some really good traditions. And just think about your testimony. And, and are you a hard worker? And whatever you do, at work, at school, are you known for that? Um, we're told in Proverbs, go to the ant, you slugger, and learn of her ways. I think some Christians that love the Lord should be the most successful even in business or an entrepreneur because you're doing everything that you have. Hopefully you're using everything that you have that is really God's for Him. And it's really, in my view, pretty easy to shine among the crowd if you just apply some of God's principles. I'll just give one example. I could give many, many. Think about who said this or who's this said about. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than who? John the Baptist. Think about that. The Lord is saying this of a human being. There's nobody greater than John the Baptist. So I looked at some of his characteristics. He had at least seven attributes that I picked out. And if you read about it, you'll know he wasn't a softy. He wasn't soft. He was pretty rugged. He was a man. He was a voice. He had a message. Everyone here has a message. You know, John said, make way, make straight the way of the Lord. We can share that same message. But he always pointed people to Christ, not to him. It wasn't about him. He said, look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He had humility. At one point he says, I'm not even worthy to loosen the sandal strap off of his feet. You know, people will sometimes try to give you praise or whatever, we need to deflect it to who it belongs to. We're nothing without Christ. And then he said, he must increase, and I must decrease. How can a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I've sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. You know, a few weeks back, back they had the Super Bowl. And um, what do you think was happening that week leading up to the Super Bowl? What's that? No, I'm talking about, okay. Yeah, that was probably happening. Gambling. There's a lot of things going on at the Super Bowl. Okay. Let's say you are, Blake, the coach of the New England Patriots. What do you think was going on that week? Okay, you're preparing, but think about this. You're already the best of the best. You got to where you are. You're not going out probably just doing some basic fundamental drills. You're, you're already in probably tip-top shape. You're, I'll bet something was going on. Someone read my mind. What, what were they talking about? 
the other team, the opponent. Absolutely. Think about that. Know your opponent. Think about in war, in strategies. They're trying to know what's going on their, on their enemy. You know, one of the, the big things about uh, Tom Brady and Bill Bel Belichick, which they, they lost, though, but they were known for amazing in-game strategy. Even at halftime, they could be way down just implementing a game plan of basically what's happening. I remember back when I played <coughs> high school baseball a long time ago in the 80s, and um, I played third base, I played right field, and then I would pitch. Well, what do you think happened on the day that I was going to be pitching? You know, the, the coach would come to me, and what do you think he would talk to me about? Yeah, he would go through the lineup of the opposing batter. Why was that important? You know, if there's this guy that just crushes fastballs down the middle, you think I'm going to throw a fastball down the middle? Or if this guy can't hit a curveball to save his life, I'm going to throw him all curveballs until he can hit it. So you've got to know your opponent. I was listening to a video of Josh McDowell the other day. He probably has given more public debates on defending the Christian worldview and Christianity than anybody. And he said this. He goes, by now, you know, he's an older man. I know what I believe. I know my stuff. I spend 95% of my time studying what my opponent is all about. And that's how you win a debate, by knowing what they believe. <clears throat> As Christians, and it's been mentioned here, we have an adversary. He doesn't want us to think about him. But he's the God of this world. In 1 Peter 5, we're told about, he goes about like a roaring lion, seeking him way to bow. And I mentioned this, you know, out in the wild, out on the African Serengeti, the animals that are toast are the weak, the sick, the babies, maybe they're out on the fringes, and they get picked off by the lions or whoever's after them. And, but Satan's multifaceted. He, sometimes he's, he comes in a different approach. Sometimes it's a frontal assault. Sometimes it's deceptive. And we have to be careful. We have to respect our opponent's power. And we're going to talk about we serve an amazing God who is much greater than the God of this world, but he's no match, I'm no match for him without God, right? <clears throat> Listen to this, I ran across, this is great. The eagle does not fight the snake on the ground. It picks it up into the sky and changes the battle ground. It then releases the snake into the sky. The snake has no stamina, no power, no balance in the air. It's useless, it's weak, and it's vulnerable, unlike on the ground where it's powerful, wise, and deadly. Take your fight into the spiritual realm by praying. And when you are in the spiritual realm, God takes care of your battles. Don't fight the enemy in his comfort zone. Change the battleground like the eagle and let God take charge through your prayer. You know, there's many, I'm not going to go through all of them, but there's many descriptions of Satan. Um, the accuser, the brethren, the adversary, the devil, the serpent, a prince of the power of the air, the ruler of darkness, the tempter, the thief. There's so many things. Um, and in John 10, we're told what one of his primary goals is. In John 10, 10, what is one of Satan's primary goals? And it doesn't take a lot of precision to do it when you want to be destructive. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. That's what Satan, the God of this world, wants for every one of you young people. He wants to kill you, to steal, and destroy you. In that same passage, we're told what Jesus Christ's goal for you is. I've come that you might have life, but not just life that you may have it more abundantly. You see the huge contrast? This battle that's going on between Satan and Christ? But he doesn't force us. So, here's some good news. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Um, we can resist him. I'll give you four quick um, keys to resisting. This isn't exhaustive. Keys to resisting the influence of Satan, the devil. 
<clears throat> Number one, recognize and acknowledge sin in your life and repent of them. Living in sin is Satan's hated. Think about this. Even as a Christian, when you have sin in your life and unconfessed sin in your life, isn't that just bondage? And then you're trying to be spiritual or you come to church, you're trying to help someone else. You have the Holy Spirit that's convicting in you. So that's Satan's battleground. You just need to confess your sin. If you're not saved, like I mentioned earlier, you need to give your whole heart to the Lord and be saved. But those of us that are saved, just recognize God. Our old man is already dead and recognize it. And it's like that motivation that I said earlier. When you recognize um, who he is. I don't want any of my children to obey me and serve me because of the consequences that may happen or this fear. You know, I've often mentioned this verse, in, the, in his presence is fullness and joy. And I've given this analogy when I was driving out to Yucca Valley, coming up this big bend, and right on the top was a CHP, Highway Patrol. And as you're going to Palm Springs right before 111, you turn off, and every single car all of a sudden slowed down, 10 and 2, perfect. As soon as you got up over the ridge and he was gone, 80 again, just boom. That's not my view of what God is or what I want to be as a parent. It's this. When you realize God's with you all the time, young guys, ladies, when you're alone in your room, school, wherever, he's always with you. And he's done, he's saved you, he's given you everlasting life. I remember wanting to serve Um, please my parents because I love them. I didn't want to disappoint. And when you realize God's with you in your car, at home, wherever, and he's always with you, and he knows what your thoughts are, but when you recognize you're always in the presence of God, I think you'll live differently. Because you want to please him, and he's with you, and you don't want, how can I go do that when he's with me? Um, and that's just a thought, in his presence, this fullness of joy. So number one, one of the ways to resist Satan is to recognize and just be clean. And don't let Satan beat you up. Acknowledge your sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse you. Number two is to submit to God. We're told in James 4, draw near to God and what will he do? He'll draw near to you. And the awesome part of it in the same passage, resist the devil and he's out of there. We can resist the devil and he will flee. That's a promise. Number three I say get dressed every day. Most of us, when you get out of bed, depending on what your job is, you dress appropriate for your job. And you get dressed for your job. Think about this. In Ephesians 6, we're told what the whole armor of God is. And you put it all on. You wouldn't go into a battlefield with the breastplate, with your sword, with your feet shod, but your, your head is exposed like this. Someone's just going to take your head off. You put on the helmet of salvation. You have the shield of faith that can quench all the fiery darts of the evil one. So number three, put on the whole armor of God. Maybe you need to read that every day, what the whole armor of God is. I'm not going to read it now. I'm going to move through this. But we can be equipped to get dressed every day. <clears throat> number four, be active in his word and prayer and what we're doing this week in fellowshipping with other saints. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you, do, as, as you see the day approaching. So I think as our culture, which we talked a little bit, is going to get worse and worse, this is even more important. We need to huddle together. We need to have Wednesday night Bible studies, breakfasts. We need fellowship to be fortified. I mean, we come up here, and basically I think we're all very on the same page. Most of us, I think, love the Lord. It's refreshing. But Monday, we're going to go back into the environment. We don't need to be afraid. God's not giving us the spirit of fear. But we can be, you know, have that power and love and a sound mind. But just remember, don't underestimate your opponent. But we don't need to be paralyzed by fear. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world.
Okay, I'll close with these last few thoughts. <clears throat> I went over some of these, um, I think last Saturday, some of those guys meet a little power on breakfast. What does it mean to be a man of God? A seven principles that I think define manhood. <clears throat> Number one, he accepts his masculinity. I have verses that go with all these. I'm not going to read them now. God designed a man to be a man and a woman to be a woman. Go on. Genesis 127, 1 Kings, 1 Timothy. Just recognize who you are and your role. I love um, just the thought of, we talked about earlier, this powerful God that could speak everything into existence. And then he created this like perfect little pocket environment in earth where it's, it's just a miracle. There's so many factors. I've done some studies on this. It'll blow your mind. There's so many factors that have to be perfectly aligned for us to even be able to live here on this earth. It's, it's called the anthropic principle. If things were just off just a little bit, we wouldn't even exist. And the God who created everything created this perfect environment for us. And he's a God of order in everything, in his creation, down to the simplest cell that at one time Darwin thought was very simple. It's extremely complex. And he's a God of order. And you can take that same order into our relationships, into a husband and a wife. And if we follow God's order, there's beauty that comes out of that. Um, I got off track. Accept your masculinity. You speak and act with maturity. You know, I'm not, I don't have any specifics, but think about it, young man. How are you, maybe when you go to a Bible study or a church camp, what do you like the rest of the week, the month, when you're maybe not around your friends? You know, in, in um, we went over this passage at the breakfast in Titus 2, and it talks about young men being spiritually minded, soberly minded, having a pattern of good works. I think it's fine to have fun. I love to joke around and tease. But what are you known for? What is your testimony? Titus talks about a pattern. What is your pattern, young man? Again, God is with us. We can't fool him. But what is our pattern? Um, and then... Do I embrace responsibility? Do I function independently? What that means is we're told to leave and cleave. And when you, when you get married, now you're a new um, family. And, and that's so exciting. Do you lead your family faithfully if you have a family? Do you recognize your accountability? And the last one, you're an image bearer of God. You represent the creator of the universe. So I have um, five questions to ask yourself, men and women. You could apply it to yourself. Do you ever have moments where you're just dead honest with yourself and with God? <clears throat> I think these are some good questions just to talk to God about. Number one, what are the biggest barriers in your relationship with God right now? Number two, what are the biggest barriers in relationship with your wife or your husband if you're married? What are the most serious temptations you're facing right now? What are your greatest points of vulnerability? How can your Christian brothers help you the most? And then I, I have this last thing I'll close on is accountability. Um, I think this is a good idea to have people in your life, mentors, friends, maybe you have a little men's group. I think it'd be good for women too to have some people you can connect with. Questions, and, and this really is being vulnerable, and that's why it's really important to have people that you can trust, because we're all these sinners. But I think if you had a little group where you met, whether it's a breakfast or a lunch, or just maybe it's one-on-one -on -one with somebody, I have 10 questions that I think would be what I call a good accountability network. It sounds like some of this maybe happened this morning, which I'm thankful for. <clears throat> what has God shown you recently from his word? That'd be a great thing to talk about, right? right? Just with a few guys or ladies. What is God showing you right now from your word? What happened this week or this month that really put you to the test? And how did you respond? How are you doing with your relationship with your wife, with your husband? How are you doing in your relationship with your children or other family members? How are your relationships at school, at work, in the church? How are you doing with your thought life? 
What kind of ministry did you have this week? Everyone in this room has a ministry. We're all servants, and we have a ministry. Who did you share Christ with? How did you use your gifts, your resources to help and or serve others that are in need? Is there anything else God is convicting of you right now? And how can we pray for you and support you this week, this month, this hour? I think those are good questions to be able to ask other members of the body of Christ at a small, intimate level just to help you. When you're on your deathbed, you talk about perspective, things matter, right? Sometimes people hold things their whole life, and maybe they don't even share it on the deathbed, but when they do, it's something extremely important. They want you to get this, or they want to share something with a family member, or maybe get something off their conscience. I think of the Apostle Paul and the books that he wrote. We come all the way to the last chapter of the last book that he wrote, 2 Timothy, the fourth chapter. And I think the Apostle Paul wanted us to get it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally. Imagine Clint right now in the presence of God. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And then it wasn't just about Paul. He said, and not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. That can be our legacy, to go out strong in spite of all of our failures in the past, and I'm going to make more in the future, but just make a conscious commitment, Lord, I want to be faithful. And kind of like that book I talked about halftime, I want to stop and pause more often. Is what I'm doing something that God wants me to do, or is it just my own selfish things I want to check off. Hopefully that's been helpful.